Oakland Manufacturing 202, simulating city scale transportation behavior with AWS. I'm Doug Bellin, the worldwide lead for Smart Factory within AWS. And joining me today is going to be Claire Fram, the senior product manager for City Modeling, city modeling Lab at Arup, as well as Jerry Casey, our founder of the technical lab for City Modeling Lab as well. What we're gonna be talking about are a couple of very unique and fun things. First thing that we'll be talking about is who is Arup and how are we working together with AWS? Working around areas such as city and country transformation. Looking at moving from individual behavior to national policy. How that's gonna evolve with policy consequences over the next 10 to 50 years. And really how this is working within the agent-based model that we look at. When we look at this and work together, what happens is that Arup and AWS are looking at the performing the analysis day in and day out by using cloud capabilities to look at model processing in minutes versus hours. Looking across these disparate teams, both internal and external, to be able to help drive these new policy changes and capabilities. When we look at this, what we're looking at is multiple different use cases that we're working with with our customers and ultimately the customers of our partners as well. Looking at transportation and transit capabilities and how that is going to change. Looking at how we can get better at citizen engagement. Looking at different ways to deploy and manage municipal services. Traffic flow control and traffic capabilities over the next 10 to 50 years as we must start to move forward water and energy management and understanding where these are being used and how they're being used and how we can create and change these moving forward. And AWS is bringing a few things to the partnership. We're bringing the internet of things, being able to have the edge and disconnected capabilities to still do data aggregation, moving that data to a cloud environment so we can actually understand what just happened or what could be happening and modeling that behavior towards the near future that modeling works off of our data models to be able to help build new capacity and new capability to have those new insights being driven by artificial intelligence and machine learning because of the wealth of data that we're starting to get. And these data sets are incredibly large, but the data is incredibly valuable for us as we move forward. Adding voice capabilities to here. So we have new insights and new capabilities, not having the type, but using the in input of the future of voice and then adding aug augmented reality into here to be able to have those new insights and be able to see this from multiple different formats. Could it be deep visualization capabilities or more as we start to move forward? Ultimately, let's pass the ball over to Claire. Claire, please describe what we've been doing together and how this is going to help change the market and change how we are living our lives over the next 10 to 50 years. Thanks, Doug. I'm Claire Fram. I'm the Senior Product Manager at Arup City Modeling Lab. And we're helping transport authorities, national governments, and city planners plan for more sustainable, more equitable, healthier futures. And we do that using agent-based modeling. Our team is made up of a diverse group of data scientists, transport planners, economists, and software engineers to help us make that happen. So what we do at the City Modeling Lab is we simulate everyone's day. Each individual uh, in our worlds um, tries to go about their day, going to work, going to school, going shopping. And in order to do that, they have to make decisions about how they will get there and in what order they might do things, what time they might leave the house so that they're not late to work. We're able to understand then micro trends, um, but we're also able to put these together to understand important macro trends, like what is the consequence on emissions? What is the consequence of this travel on congestion? Um, and how might this impact uh, the health of our cities as well? This type of approach has been in academia for the last 50 or so years and has been applied uh, in the transport modeling space in the last 10 to 20 years. But it really hasn't been commercially viable until we were able to use the power of cloud compute. With the power of the cloud, <clears throat> we are able to do this with um, huge volumes of data within a time frame that gives us reasonable results. Where have we been doing it and how big are these models? So we've been working with Transport for London, TFL, for the past two years, 
uh, as part of a great research partnership to explore how agent-based modeling might fit within their toolkit of understanding travel in London. We've been working with the Ministry of Transport in New Zealand, who are trying to understand really complex policy questions in a changing world where we have new modes of transport and new considerations. Um, when For them, it's really important to keep things like sustainability and equity at the heart of their decision-making processes. And we're working with Transport Infrastructure Ireland on another really great project. And they're trying to understand how might changes to their road tolling systems impact individuals when it comes to equity, emissions, um, and overall revenue to keep their business uh, sustainable. So ultimately, we're not building transport models, we're building social models. <clears throat> and this is an important thing to understand. Um, by considering the wider complexity of the feedback and interaction between multiple systems on how people behave, we can better understand how changes to infrastructure or policy might actually play out in the future. So if we change how a road is priced, that might change who uses the road. It also might change how many people end up traveling by car in the first place. But often it's not just a road price that is changed. There might be other infrastructure uh, changes that are happening at the same time. So if it becomes more uh, desirable to cycle because there's also a new cycle lane that's been put in at the same time, how do we understand the complexities and feedback between these different changes and how it impacts our overall decisions about what to do and also ultimately how to travel there? The reason that we're pursuing this approach and that we're excited about this approach is that traditional transport models they just struggle to answer some of these more complex questions that are also important to understand granular um, data be behind them. So traditional approaches, they had to make use of aggregate data. <clears throat> so that means that they made use of um, macro trends that were pretty consistent over the years. <clears throat> they took advantage of the uh, assumptions that everybody had a nine to five day, you worked five days a week, and we kind of knew where people lived and people wanted to go to work. <clears throat> uh, commuting trends were really the drivers in transport planning for really a long time. But we're seeing that the way that we're traveling is changing. We are now in the UK doing more trips for shopping and leisure activities than we are just going to work and home. So we're still traveling further and furthest for our jobs, but we're taking more types of trips. And we're actually changing the way that we commute. So COVID-19 has really sped up trends that we've seen with flexible working and working more um, complex, uh, in more complex ways than our nine to five, five days a week. And traditional models have a really hard time understanding who might be going to work, where does that mean that they start from? Uh, and, and taking into account this granular understanding of, of these changes that we might be seeing. So what if our future looks different? What if we no longer have to travel so far to access certain amenities like leisure, restaurants? Um, what if our food systems end up being closer to the city centers? How does that impact the freight on our streets? There's a lot that's changing about our world, and we think agent-based models is an exciting way to help us understand this complexity and also the consequences, again, when it comes to who's impacted, what are the emissions consequences, and what is the air quality consequences. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Jerry, who's gonna take you a little bit on a tour inside one of our models. Thanks, Claire. Um, so I'm Jerry Casey. I'm the uh, technical lead at the, the City Modeling Lab at ARP. Um, so as Claire has kind of really well uh, described the sort of context that we're operating in here, um, of course, you need to get into the tech, which is like our, our technical response, the, the things that we're building um, in order to try and answer some of these really difficult sort of existential questions for, for many of our um, cities and the places that we live as human beings. Um, and so we, we traditionally in the, in the sort of urban planning world treat this as a, a supply and demand problem. So you can see in this diagram here, 
we have representations of the population. That's who people are, where they live, what they do, and really critically what they care about. So if you imagine, you know, someone who's going to pick up their kids and um, maybe exactly the same person as someone on the train going to work, but they'll have very different decision making. So we try and capture like a rich representation of who they are, what they care about and all their constraints and the kind of things that they really want to try and optimize. And then on the opposite side, we've got like a representation of space, where the roads are, where the trains are, where the subway is, where there are bike lanes, where there aren't, where you can get Uber, where you can't. Um, and the whole sort of um, spatial representation that we are faced with as human beings every day when we leave our front door and we want to try and get get out, see our friends and so on. Um, in the center then, of course, we have this representation of a model that, as Clara said, has been around for you know, many, many years. Um, and we build on something that's open source, that's been um, painstakingly put together by academics in Switzerland, um, Germany, and lots of other countries, of course, as well, um, mostly from ETH and TU, um, Munich and Berlin which is a MATSIM, which is a multi-agent transport simulation where agents can make choices. They can try and take different routes at different times of the day. They can try and take the train or they can take their own car. Um, and then we use that as a sort of simulation engine where we throw all of these different sort of demands what people want to do into the, into the model and we try and see what it is that they, they do in competition with each other. And then from the outputs from that model, we can begin to see, does it add up with what we see in the real world? You know, if I stand in a street corner and I look at how many people are in the bus, and does it add up with what our model says, or are we sort of over-predicting or under-predicting? And with time, we can begin to calibrate real human behavior and sort of think along the lines of um, treating people as individuals who, at different times of the day, will have different priorities, some more sort of behavioral economics and less sort of rational, perfect information agents. Um, and we can use this, of course, then, once we've got a base representation, to begin then to do really interesting things, which is we can begin to change um, the sort of inputs, i.e. begin to give different populations. Um, do we have new developments in certain parts of the town? Are loads of people going to be moving there in a new housing development? Do we have new jobs, new employment? Um, and then equally, we can begin to do super interesting things in the world around us. Um, everything from the really topical investments at present in cycling infrastructure, um, thinking of Paris and Anne Hidalgo's efforts to you know, remove road space from cars and massively increase the access that active modes have. Um, to some of the more politically challenging things like road pricing, where drivers are being asked to contribute towards the cost of the, um, of the infrastructure they're using. And then equally, really, really big changes that we can make. So that would be you know, new railway lines, high-speed rail um, interventions, the likes of which you know, Californian high-speed rail, um, of course, new subway interventions that you see in Hong Kong, London, cities like that have been pushing these forward for many, many years. And each of these agents then, of course, has, has choice. And um, each of them has been trying to optimize what their day looks like. And if you imagine every single individual in this world has, has had times when they've tried to take the bus, but the bus has been late and they've learned over time, mm, maybe better whenever I've got these constraints to do something slightly different. Um, and equally then we have um, all of the different choices associated with the route that you might want to take. Um, and equally the time that you might want to leave. So you may learn with time that it's better to leave slightly earlier or to go a bit later. Um, and all of these different sort of really small, discrete choices are the kind of things that over time can result in really big changes. And if everyone makes similar decisions at the same, at the same time, you can have quite evolving systems that we all have to deal with and respond to in real time. I'm sort of thinking of the kind of challenges that we see when everybody um, flees the city at Thanksgiving when they want to go and see their family. And of course, the, the real devil in the detail with a lot of these things is that just because you can doesn't necessarily mean you should. And any model is only as good as the metrics that you have that can give you confidence that the model is doing and the things that you care about. And this is just a good example of some work that Arab did um, with KPMG for Infrastructure for Victoria um, in Australia, so in Melbourne. Um, and just seeing here are sort of the traffic 101 sort of plots that we tend to do to, to give confidence that our models are behaving correctly. So on the y-axis, we're looking at the amount of vehicles, so, so crudely traffic volumes, how many cars are on certain roads. And on the x-axis, we're looking at times of the day. So you can see, like, as you'd expect, you've got the sort of AM and PM peaks, the sort of nine to five distribution, as you would expect. Um, and you can see here, we've got uh, the light blue line, which is traffic counters, which is sort of an automatic um, sensor data that we get in. And then we have here the agent-based model, which is um, simulated over time. And as you can see, quite sort of obvious, you can see here that we've got a reasonably good representation of the hour by hour, and in fact, minute by minute distributions that we see. So there's a whole host of churning sort of agent decisions under the hood here that are contributing to give out like a really simple plot. But understanding that sort of underlying complexity is sort of the critically important thing if we are to have any chance in understanding if we change X or we change Y, we make a road in a new place, we change where people live or work. 
um, what those potential implications may be. So underneath the hood for us, as I said, we were building on you know, academically robust um, and critically for us open source um, software. Um, and in this case, we're building solely around something called Matson, which is a agent-based simulation framework. And we put a whole host of sort of wrapping things around this to, to make our lives easier. Um, and some of this is, is work that we've done in Python ourselves. Um, and a great deal of this is, of course, using AWS functions, which have sort of turbocharged um, how fast we can run at these things. Um, and sort of a good example of this, to, to give it a sort of practical standpoint, is that um, whenever COVID-19 hit, um, it obviously had pretty significant impact um, in London, as it has in many cities and countries around the world. And we'd had um, a research project with TFL over a couple of years to build up an agent-based representation of London. Um, and London's daytime population, you know, is somewhere between 8 and 9 million people. So that's obviously a reasonably large city. And you've got tubes, you've got subways, you've got an enormous bus network. Um, and you've got railway lines um, stretching and giving access to effectively more than just the southeast of England, but most of Great Britain. So you've got this huge sort of spatially complex and also diverse with different people doing different types of things model. Um, and we were working with TFL to, to sort of apply and see what some of the COVID implications may be using this, using this model. Um, so if you can imagine, if you're a sort of modeling person, the, the calibration of such a model, i.e. How, how do you tweak and give agents behaviors, and how do you give the model sort of behavioral realistic representations of, of how people make decisions is sort of a ch very challenging problem. Um, and it's computationally quite an expensive problem. So Clara rightly said, you know, 10 minutes ago, um, these models have been talked about for a long time, but the real challenge we often have is critically getting them up and running quickly enough. Um, so we were able to, with TFL, um, in a matter of weeks, um, able to do some parameter sweeps and calibrations um, on a model of London. And just to give some sort of idea of what the scope and complexity of this, if you're running, you know, one or even a 10% sample of London, you're, you're somewhere in the region of 100,000 to 1 million agents. Each of these agents in their given day could have a few hundred events. And an event is, you know, leaving the house, um, getting to the bus stop, getting on the bus, um, on the bus, exiting road Y and getting onto road Z. You could have a few hundred events per agent. And um, if you imagine you want to do this for every second of, of the day, and you want to do that for a few hundred days to get a feeling for how stable the results are, um, and you're trying to calibrate that, so you want to do maybe 100,000 iterations of this, um, you're really talking about like a computational footprint that historically has only really been available to large-scale research institutions and universities. Um, but we were able to, using um, Lambda step functions um, and some other wrappings around that and critically batch compute, we were able to really take like a shotgun to this approach um, and do some really interesting widespread parameter um, sweeping and searching. And we were able to calibrate a model um, in a time that really wouldn't really have been possible until um, you know, at least five years ago. Um, so this is something that was sort of academically talked about, but we were able to sort of rapidly and in a sensible way take this to application really, really quite quickly. Um, and this sort of diagram gives you a feeling for some of the relatively simple, but the complexity of, of the ecosystem that we built around um, some really well-known transparent um, academic um, contributions. Now, of course, uh, you know, we've, we've sort of spoken about the tools and tools are only as good as what you decide to do with them. Um, and this is sort of the, the challenge that, you know, truthfully, we as humans who live in cities and not even people that live in cities, people that live anywhere have to make decisions about what they care about in their prioritization. Um, so agent-based dynamic models are, are really helpful and useful in enabling us to um, begin to see what the future may look like and take a sort of scenario approach about how it is that we might better realize or, or create a future that we care about. Um, and truthfully, there are choices here. Um, and not all of these are coherent and not all of these add up. Um, and there is effectively the challenge to find out what is most appropriate. Um, you know, cycling and, and active modes have been shown to be extremely effective and productive ways of connecting people with opportunities and places. Um, and equally, highways are, of course, you know, the backbone of many economies. But um, too many highways, too much congestion, too much induced demand is really a sort of dangerous precedent that we've learned many, many times in human history that adding capacity um, isn't a particularly good way of reducing congestion. Sort of the, the analogy goes that you don't lose weight by getting a bigger belt. And equally, we've seen much um, and really interesting, exciting opportunities with autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles. Um, but, you know, if you replace every single vehicle on the road with an electric vehicle, you still have plenty of traffic. Um, so agent-based models are really helpful because we can do lots of little small interventions. We can, we can see what, you know, doing a really targeted cycling and active mode transport um, intervention might be in a sort of local neighborhood area. 
we could see how that can be combined then with a large infrastructure project, a, a big new railway line or a big highway project, and equally find out what areas would most benefit from autonomous or electric vehicles. And we can kind of test all these different scenarios and combinations and sort of moving away from a dogmatic view about what the future um, should look like with a certain technology and trying to find a way of layering all of these different pieces together so that we can find a thing that serves most of our users, most of our people in a fair and equitable way, giving everyone access to different opportunities and not unduly targeting or dismissing certain people. Um, and to learn more, we've, we've put together a blog in recent times that we've been pretty good at updating. Um, and there's some interesting case studies there that go into some of the interesting technical challenges about how you mo run models and simulations at the scale, some of which is truthfully very, um, very much on the cutting edge sort of academically um, and equally some really pragmatic views on, on, on what it is, the kind of questions that we're trying to answer for different clients around this world, around the world. And as we very much, you know, begin to get back into the, the, the way of thinking of with vaccinations coming for COVID-19, how do you build back better? Um, how do you begin to build upon behavioral change? Because I presume many of the people watching this talk are not sitting in office blocks or in their, um, or in their traditional desk where they would have been two or three years ago. Um, but that everybody's behavior will change whenever COVID-19 um, hopefully is something that we look back on. There will be medium and long-term implications because of the, all of the infrastructure and what we've learned about working from home. So there will be sort of significant changes um, that will result in this sort of quite significant big event. And finally, um, it would be really good to, to hear from anybody that wants to kind of talk to us about any of those different things that we talked about. So we're quite keen to talk to research institutions, academics who are working on different problems. And um, equally, if you're a city or a local authority or a transport agency that's interested in, um, you know, exploring and seeing what these um, different techniques might look like for you, we'd be really interested. Um, and anyone in the in the technology space, so anybody interested in autonomous vehicles or has some sort of new mobility offering that they'd like to see how we might be able to test it out within the sort of sandboxes and play pits that we've created. It'd be great to hear from you too. Thank you very much.